Welcome to Intimate Judaism. My name is Rabbi Scott Kahn. I'm Tally Rosenbaum. Uh, today we have what I think is going to be an important episode. Uh, we originally were going to talk, continue our series about um, sexuality throughout the life cycle in married couples, um, beginning with uh, what we had begun talking about, infertility and then pregnancy and then postpartum. So our next natural um episode was going to be on uh, how married couples navigate um, sexuality and intimacy in midlife from their 40s, 50s, 60s, etc. And then um, I think what we decided to do before we do that, we want to really target um, a demographic that isn't really, that, that gets left out a lot in the conversation about intimacy and sexuality, and that is people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who are dating, um, who are dating because they're alone and they would like to be able to form a relationship, but it is complicated. It's complicated whether it's because of past experiences due to divorce, um, uh, loss, loss of widow being a widow and what it means again to start again in an intimate relationship. And also we want to acknowledge and talk about the experience of people who have never been married and have never been in that kind of relationship and are still trying to do that um, in midlife and what that what can what that can be like. I think it's really important that we have this discussion for this demographic. So they, you know, so we don't leave people out of the discussion about intimacy. Absolutely. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, remember to check out our website, IntimateJudaism.com, for the full podcast archive, show notes, a free men's mikvah checklist, and more. Subscribe to Intimate Judaism wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, etc. Rate and review. Please leave a comment as well. Tell people about Intimate Judaism and share the podcast so that we can continue to grow our audience, our past two months have been our two biggest months of all time. So we thank you very much for helping us out. Please join the Intimate Judaism team on Patreon. Patreon supporters get bonus material, episodes, merch, and more. You can find the link in the description of the podcast and in the show notes. Write to us at intimatejudaism at jewishcoffeehouse.com. Visit jewishcoffeehouse.com and tallyrosenbaum.com. Tally, I'd like to begin today's episode by mentioning something that happened on the Orthodox Conundrum Facebook group, the Orthodox Conundrum discussion group on Facebook. You would put up a post there asking for people to send in their questions and comments about today's episode in preparation for this episode. And there were some people on that group, and I don't want to oversimplify their arguments, but at the risk of oversimplification, they basically said, what's to talk about? What is worth discussing in this particular topic? Because either if we're going to be discussing sexuality at midlife and later and among singles, either the people are breaking halacha or... They're not, in which case they're sexually frustrated, and that's it. And that's basically the binary that was set up. Again, I know I'm oversimplifying. And I wanted to ask you to perhaps explain why you and I think that that is not correct and why this topic does need to be addressed, despite that argument that it really is pointless. Well, I don't think it's pointless to discuss sexuality and intimacy, um, even if uh, it may be against the halacha to engage in it. That's two separate things. So I don't think it's pointless at all. I also don't want to reduce the experience of people, you know, real human beings who have been through a lot in their lives and sexuality is part of who they are. I don't want to reduce it to, you know, whether they transgress or don't transgress. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, I don't think it's about that. I think that, um, that part, that decision to engage is governed by many, many different factors. And one of them is certainly going to be halachic, but there are many, many other factors that we need to think about um, whether or not the decision is made to engage, how to engage, um, you know, how to talk about things like consent, um, how to, you know, what is, what are the ethics around it? What are the concerns around it? Um, just reducing people to just whether or not they're sinning because they're having sex when they shouldn't be, or even just not being Shomer Nagia, maybe not having sex. But I don't think that's the issue. I think that there's really a lot to talk about here. And also a lot of, if, if that's the kind of attitude, then I also think that we have a lot to do in terms of helping people to understand the complexity 
um, to, to be empathic and understanding of what it must be like to be alone and to have suffered loss. I mean, there's a lot of loss involved here. There's loss involved for certainly for people who have lost their spouses to death. Um, there's certainly loss if the person that they lost was sick for a, a long time. Um, that kind of loss of the ability to connect sexually will have already begun much earlier into the process. Um, for couples who lost a spouse suddenly without any warning, there is a sudden cutoff from having a spouse, having a partner, having a best friend, and having a lover all at once. So there's a huge amount of loss that needs to be um, you know, processed and dealt with. Um, there's also loss for single people um, who did not merit to find a partner. There's a lot of, um, you know, a kind of ongoing um, loneliness and ongoing frustration with relationships that don't work out. So I think that recognizing that there's a lot of loss here and there's a loss also of your sexuality as a human being. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean to your sexuality when you don't have a partner to express it with? And to what extent when you navigate the idea of committing to somebody new, um, how, since that sexual piece is so much a part of you now and has had been so much a part of your previous relationships, you know, how do you go into a second marriage um, without that piece? How do you even go into the creation of an intimate relationship, you know, when you're um, dating in this age group? Um, it's going to feel very, very different to be Shomer Nagia, let's say, at 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, not that it's easy then either, um, but it's different. It, it's different. It's, it's you know, when physical intimacy has been a part of how you express love, because that's what you did with your previous partner, it's, it's going to feel very different and awkward. And there's like so many different types of scenarios that I can bring just based on the kind of um, situations that come into my, into my clinic. And I think that there is a strain within Judaism that effectively looks at Judaism. I'm using that term advisedly. Judaism and halakha, Jewish law, are one and the same. Like what is halakha is Judaism. What is Judaism is halakha. And nothing outside of that realm is Jewish, if I can use that term. And I do acknowledge that such a strain does exist within Judaism, but I think that uh, it's wrongheaded for us to pretend there aren't other ways of looking at it that understand Judaism as something which is bigger than just halakha. That includes halakha and halakha and. There are other ways of looking at things. Not that I'm saying that halakha is not normative. I'm not trying to say that oh, there are many ways of being Jewish, you don't have to keep halakha. That is not what I'm saying. But to reduce Judaism and reducing our entire way of looking at the world to does it fit within a halakhic framework or not, and that's all there is to discuss, I think is certainly a gross oversimplification of many strands of thought within Judaism, and even within those that see halakha as the primary or the only aspect of what Judaism is about. It's also reductionist to say there's nothing to talk about, emotions don't matter. So I think that there's some... Uh, Someone mentioned the term halachic maximalism, looking at that as effectively defining what we are as Torah Jews, I think, in this particular context is not fair. I think there has to be a lot more that we have to see, even if we are halachically committed, absolutely, which I hope that I hope that I am. At the same time, to reduce everything just to whether it is allowed or not, and that's all that Torah cares about, I think, is reducing Torah more than Torah deserves to be reduced. Tali, I want to actually mention and quote somebody who wrote to me in response to your post. I want to mention that this woman is a divorcee. She's religious. And I just want to quote a few lines of what she wrote, because I think it, at least the conflict, this, this issue that comes up for many people, older singles, can be seen in some of what she mentions. Let me read some of her some of her words. I don't want to be married necessarily. Second marriage and kids is so hard to balance, but I want companionship. And I've chosen a certain lifestyle that doesn't encourage casual dating or not being Shomer Nagia. So now I'm forced to be alone and isolated or compromise halacha and be physical or settle for marriage when I know it will be too hard. How does one discuss their preference for bedroom life while still appearing modest and sanua. Also, many parents live in communities that are family-based and not social life-based. So I sit home alone, lonely on Shabbat. The person I went out with tonight, he's from, we discussed after a few days of chatting that he is kinky, 
And he said that he has hooked up with many from women who are kinky, and I believe it. I think a lot more goes on than people talk about, and it's a shame the community does not accept that older singles will date and be physical. So we have to hide it, and then that's not emotionally healthy. But finding this part of myself was very healthy for me. I'm happy to open up anonymously. I'm happy to open up anonymously for others to know about this. She continues, my boyfriend lived with me for half a year, and many of my friends knew, and it was what and it was what it was. Yet my children go to Haredi schools. Is it ideal? No. Did people judge? I don't know. Did anyone say anything to me? No, because I only told people whom I trust. But as a from Jew, how could I in good conscience do something that's not allowed and against what's binding? I don't eat lobster. Why is this different? Does God want us to rush into things, create mental health stress for us and our children, just to obtain a natural human desire of physicality and intimacy and connectedness? I'm not asking you per se. I'm saying it's a lose-lose no matter what. I just want to do God's will and be happy. And physical connection brings me happiness. People say go hiking with a female friend, but it's not the same. We crave connection, closeness, trust, vulnerability. I'm not even reading everything that she wrote, but I think wow. in some ways, Tali, this it's like a cri de coeur. You see, she goes back and forth while describing her emotions. She says, I need connection. Of course I'm physical and people shouldn't judge, but I'm violating God's will and that really bothers me. And it, this this dynamic tension going on in her mind, her emotions, is, is very touching, I thought. The way that she really doesn't know what to do, even though she's made a decision. She's made a decision that she's not Shomer Nagia. At the same time, she doesn't pretend that, that oh, I'm doing exactly what Halakha demands. She knows that she's not. But she says, I don't really know what else I'm supposed to do. And I wanted to sort of throw that out there just as a way, as a means to open up our conversation today. Maybe you can comment on this because, again, I know we're not really just discussing halakha. Halakha is pretty clear about the impermissibility of touching outside of marriage. There's not much to talk about that when we're speaking about some sort of derech hiba. We're talking about intimate touch, whether it's hugging and kissing. I don't really see halacha allowing that. I don't want to pretend otherwise. But to pretend there's nothing else to talk about is wrongheaded. Anyway, I'll pass it over to you now, Tali. Wow, there's so much to process um, in this letter that you just read to me. And I think it's rich. It's rich with... Um, a description, such an authentic description of, you know, somebody's vulnerability and somebody's real um, experience. And it's such an opportunity. This would be a wonderful kind of case to bring before a room full of rabbis who are hopefully learning a little bit about what it means to be a pastoral counselor as a rabbi. Um, because all too often, we get that same very binary black and white, yeah, halacha, halacha, and da, 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 like as if as if somebody's bringing you a chicken, kosher or not kosher. Mm -hmm. um, and here, what we're dealing with is that there's a lot of complexity to people, and there's a lot of complexity to the situation, and there is often a need to really appreciate that we can integrate different parts of ourselves and live our best lives in terms of living our lives with integrity. I, I just want to add one something? thing. No, no, I think I, I agree 100%. I'm just anticipating some people saying, and by the way, probably there was a time when I would have said this myself. So I want to ask you to confirm. People probably say, okay, well, that's unfortunate, but she is the exception to the very large rule where most from people are not doing that when they're single and they're older. And from what I've seen, from what she says, and I'm going to assume, I want to ask to confirm with you, that from what you've seen in your practice, that is not true. While there certainly are people who are older singles or later singles who are Shomer Nagia, there are plenty in the from world. And I don't just mean the left-wing Orthodox world. I mean, across the Orthodox spectrum, there are plenty who do touch and who are engaged in intimate touch and in sexuality, even when they're not married. Is that accurate? Yeah. And this is why I think that we need to move away from the question of you know, whether, because that's a decision that each person needs to kind of make with their own process of um, what feels right and how, you know, they can live with integrity with their decisions, um, but also how, you know, what, it's not just about 
okay, I'm going to have sex or not going to have sex, or I'm going to be showmare or not be, be showmare. There's a whole world of how to navigate. Um, you know, your, your, your friend who wrote you the letter um, spoke about, uh, you know, hooking up and kink and all sorts of things that happen with divorced religious people. That's kind of one way of navigating sex. And then there's also the idea of, you know, companionship and the idea of, um, sex in the context of a serious committed relationship or the building of a committed relationship. Those may not, those may not be so different in terms of the halachic, you know, um, legitimacy or not of those things, but they're certainly very different in terms of Jewish ethics and values. You know, we can certainly, um, decide that if we are going to like what, how you put break halacha, um, you know, we can still do it in the context of acting within our best selves Jewishly. Um, but I think what's most important about what you bring is that I'm hoping that it really does allow people who are listening to this podcast to be able to look at people in a different way with empathy, with understanding, um, you know, the kind of conflicts that are so difficult, you know, being single, not having a companion, not being allowed halachically to express yourself in a sexual way. This is the same for LGBTQ people in, in a way, like we have to be able to broaden our ability to be more compassionate, to be more understanding and to stop judging because it's nobody's God darn business what people are doing sexually. It's like people get so, I don't know, like they, they get so triggered, they get so reactive and I'm sure that they have their own histories that create that. But what I wanna do here is to be able to say, look, it is happening. And if it is happening, let's be able to talk about what we need to talk about in navigating these relationships. So what your friend, first of all, um, the letter talked about not wanting to get married. I think that we have to recognize that often women, if there was an aguna situation, if there was an abuse situation, if there were marital dynamics that, you know, felt um, oppressive, um, a woman may not want to enter into a kiddushin situation again. You know, she may want to have a committed relationship, but may be afraid of the whole institution of marriage. So that's and this a letter writer that, seems to be in that category. Yeah, yeah, it, it could very well be. Um, and and so, you know, I don't know how old this this woman is um, either. She might, you know, so she might still develop and change and decide otherwise. But for her, um, I think that the most important question is, look, I don't eat lobster. I don't do other things. I send my kids to Haredi schools. How can I like how how do I be with myself around this? I think that this is an amazing question. It's an amazing question that comes to rabbis and it's an amazing question that comes to therapists. And it's really about, you know, from from a from a therapeutic and also pastoral rabbinic point of view, it's really about being with that person in her dilemma, in her conflict, without judgment, um, really understanding that, you know, choosing this does not make her a bad person. Um, she understands, but you know, the way you're going to choose it, does that mean you're going to go hook up every night, you know, not think about STDs, not think about consent boundaries? Like, no, these are important things to talk about. Maybe even mikvah is an important thing to talk about because we're still, you know, we don't have to throw the whole thing out. We can still act within the framework of our Jewish values. And I think that that's an important message. I think it's also important to say that when we talk about not being judgmental, that does not mean that we have to assume everyone's values are equally good and they can do whatever they want and I can do whatever I want and I don't care what I do or and nothing is binding. There's a very big gap between basically moral nihilism and saying do whatever you want versus I'm not going to judge anybody even though I maintain my own values and know what I would want to do I hope if I were in that situation though I can't judge you meaning I know what I can do I know what I believe is right and I can accept somebody even if I don't necessarily think that those choices are choices that I would choose myself I just don't want it to be that non-judgmentalism means that everything everyone does is great and I can necessarily approve of no one's asking me for my approval, so therefore I'm not going to give it or, or withdraw it. But 
there's a very big difference between approval per se, at least in theory, and acceptance and understanding that I'm not in that person's shoes. I can have empathy for a person saying, I don't know what it's like. That's not my situation. Or even if I think it's similar to my situation, no one's situation is identical and therefore there's no room to judge. Only God can judge. But at the same time, I don't want that to turn into that, oh, Scott Kahn just said halacha isn't binding. That's not what I mean. I think that halacha is normative for Jews and I hope that Jews do keep halacha. At the same time, I never judge anybody, at least not, I try not to, because I don't know what God thinks. That's not for me to decide. I'd like to also mention something else, Tali. Somebody named Mark Fine reached out to me on Facebook. I had not met him before, but he reposted your post. And I thought he had some very important points that he made. First of all, I'd like to say, in thanking him, that he pointed out that he really appreciated that you wrote a difference between sexuality and intimacy in your post. You mentioned sexuality and intimacy. And that relates to what you just mentioned. And I asked him, why is that important to you? What does that mean? And his first reaction to that in explaining it to me, I spoke to him as a, re as a result of his post. He said that these things are really two different categories because even though we confuse them and treat them as the same thing, there's a very big difference emotionally. There's a very big difference in terms of the way we relate to ourselves and to others. If a person simply is, uh, is, is you know, put, to put it bluntly, hungry for sex, versus somebody who is craving a type of connection expressed through touch or perhaps even expressed through sex. He said, these are not the same thing. And when I asked him to elaborate playing a bit of devil's advocate, I said, well, from a halakhic perspective, frankly, halakha doesn't really care, if I put it that way. Halakha doesn't care if you're hugging somebody because you crave emotional connection or because it's the prelude to sex. It remains forbidden. So again, I asked him, why does it really matter from a halachic perspective? And he mentioned two very important points. He said, first of all, and this relates to what you just said, Tali, we have to move away from that binary attitude of either you're a halachic Jew or you're not. And he said, halacha probably should be seen less as a light switch and more like a dimmer. And yes, there are people who turn everything on and there are some people who turn it off completely. And then there's a dimmer switch where some people keep some things and not other things or try their best or don't try their best and are keeping certain things. And this goes back to the question about, I don't eat lobster, but I do this. How can I understand myself? Well, if we look at Judaism only as a binary, you either do it or you don't, then we're disenfranchising a lot of people. And we can say, well, there's a dimmer switch. And again, as a halachic Jew, my, my feeling is that people should strive to keep more and more. But just because somebody isn't keeping something right now doesn't mean that we have to say, therefore, you're out of the club, and therefore, you may as well just chuck it all out and throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is a lot of room in the middle, and when we describe someone as either halachic or not halachic, we may be doing a disservice to both them and the community at large. Yeah, let's uh, treat it with compassion. Let's understand that you know society changes, and as society changes, if we stick to just looking at you know dry halacha, we will end up, um, you know not not appreciating the Jewish value of inclusion and compassion and, you know, the big picture. Where's the big picture going to go? And Tali, that gets back also to what you mentioned before about rabbis or halachic authorities or whatever, needing to look at it not only from a halachic perspective, but also from a pastoral perspective. And that relates also to what Mark said to me as well. He said, if we look at people as halacha constructs, then you're right. There's nothing to talk about except is it mutar or is it asur? But the conversations are very different if someone comes to a rabbi and says that, as I mentioned before, I'm going crazy, I need to sleep with somebody versus I miss an emotional connection with somebody. Forget the halacha for a second. As a matter, a matter of pastoral counseling, as a matter of un empathizing, understanding where they're coming from, there's an extraordinarily different approach in both cases, even if halacha technically isn't differentiating between them. And yeah. too often, too many people ignore the pastoral approach and don't necessarily hear that question as well. Yeah. By the way, like just to push the button even a little further, mm -hmm. is if somebody comes and says, look, I'm going crazy. I need to sleep with someone. There's empathy there to be had for that person as well. Oh, for sure. Really, I, really I, hard. I'm not saying that that person doesn't deserve empathy. I'm just saying it's a different question. The person is discussing yeah. a different, it's, it's basically a different issue. I hope we can empathize with everybody, but there is a different question in terms of how the person is, what, what the person's actually asking, what is really being said over there. You know, it's interesting because Mark said to me another question, another point which kind of relates to this, and I'll give back to you, Dolly, because he said, said, look, the bottom line, 
when someone goes and says those things to the rabbi, I crave this emotional connection or I crave, I crave sex, whatever, the person knows the answer already. The person isn't saying, hmm, does halacha allow me to have sex with somebody because I really, really need it? Chances are that person knows the answer. So we have to hear what really is being asked when that person goes to the rabbi and mentions that. That's really a question, a pastoral question by definition, because unless the person is truly unfamiliar with the most basic ideas of halachic attitude towards sex, the person probably knows that outside of marriage, sex is not allowed and touching is not allowed. So it's all made, it's a generally a matter of listening to the question as much as it is as giving an answer. Okay. So so thanks for that. I want to kind of move past whether it's allowed or not allowed right. and, and kind of talk about what are the real issues that come up um, for divorcees and for widowers. I'll start widows and widowers. I'll, I'll start a little bit with that. Um, so I think one thing that comes up a lot is, you know, I don't want to, um, reenact. I don't, you know, I was in a, I was in a marriage. Um, there was the dynamic of the marriage, um, the communication in the marriage, the experiences in that marriage that, you know, I want something, a tikkun, I want something different, better. Um, maybe my partner, um, had a certain orientation. Maybe that my partner was gay. Maybe my partner was into kink. Maybe, and I wasn't. Or maybe I'm into kink, and 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 I want to find someone who is. Or maybe I had, um, he had a sexual dysfunction that I don't want to encounter again. Um, you know, how am I going to know? Or a woman who's been divorced or widowed for a long time, maybe ten years or more, has not been sexually active. Um, and wants to be sexually active again because maybe she is shomer Nagia, has always been shomer Nagia, and wants and, and dates shomer and wants to get married again. Finds a lovely older man, um, but she's afraid she's not going to be able to function after all this time. Maybe it's going to be painful. Um, you know, these are issues that come up on a regular basis. Um, and I'm talking about people who come in and, and say, you know, what do I do? Because um, you know, I'm. I, I, I kind of want to, I want to know that we're sexually compatible. I want to know that we're, you know, we're not, we're not two 20 year olds who are going to figure it out together because we each don't have any past experiences. You know, we're both people with our histories. How do we figure these things out? So, you know, that's certainly something. I also think that there's this issue of vulnerability around having sex with a new person when you've only had one sexual partner your whole life. You know, the idea of taking your clothes off for somebody, the idea, and he's, he's not your husband, he hasn't kind of gone, grown with you. And also for a man, you know, it's not your wife who's known you all those years. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it feels, it can feel very scary. Your body has changed. Um, you don't know how you're going to function. It's very vulnerable the sexual place. And these are um, very important to acknowledge, to be able to communicate about, to be able to talk about. I cannot stress enough how important it is for couples to be able to voice and talk about their concerns with one another, because whether or not you choose to actually engage physically, the ability to talk about it is of paramount importance. There's one other thing I did also want to bring up in this context is that, you know, there is no consistent um, experience of people after divorce or after widowhood or also um, late singles regarding sex. Yes, it's true what you said that there is definitely this kind of very active understanding that divorced people get together, but you know, it's, it runs a spectrum. Like somebody said to me, a friend who is now married, but he was divorced for a long time. You know, um, people think that, that they're, you know, hopping into each other's beds, you know um, but there's also that. And there's also people who are very, 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 you know, um, exclusive about who they might choose to engage with um, physically. And the reason why that's so important to talk about is that a lot of um, people when they're newly divorced or been divorced for a while or even widowed, um, they, they they don't know how to navigate the whole dating thing when it comes to sex. So very often, especially like on these apps, these dating apps, um, there's a question from the get-go, um, are you showmare? Which are you showmare is sometimes like code for are you down to hook up? 
Mm-hmm. And and I've heard this from from women and 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 it's not and, really about showmere per se. It's actually it's not. It's about you know I'm I'm not I'm not really looking to date for marriage or I'm not really looking to form an intimate relationship or maybe I am also looking for those things, but I'm looking to date for sex. Hmm. Um, and that's something that you know you need to know how to navigate if you've been married for thirty years, and you suddenly find yourself single for whatever reason. Um, and you've, you know, you've not, you, you, you have to know how to be able to, you know, I had somebody say to me, like, this guy started to hold my hand and I didn't know that I wanted to hold his hand, hmm. you know, and I said, you know, and I said, well, what would it have been for you if he would have said, you know, can I hold your hand? Would it be okay to hold your hand? She said, that would have been great. Then I could have, then I would have thought about it, hmm. you know? And I, and I think that like hmm. being able to have an expectation for, people, you know, to, to, it's, you're not bad for wanting to touch. Okay. But, you know, you can't just assume that you can touch somebody. You have to negotiate it. You have to ask first, you know, you, because well, Holly, people, I, people uh, have been married for 30 years, you know, like they're, they're dealing with new people and they don't know how, and they don't always know, you know, she's, she was like, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't know what to say. I just shut down. Like, People well, how, need to be prepared to navigate this whole playing well, how, field. How do people learn how to navigate that? You said they have to be prepared to do so, but no one trains you to be an older right. single. No one trains right. you to be a divorcee now navigating new relationships. So where does a person learn that? Especially, I would assume, if people who've been previously married and now widowed or divorced, they bring with them all sorts of assumptions about how the other gender acts based on their previous assumption. They're exactly. walking in with all sorts of assumptions which may not be accurate except in their own re- their own prior relationship. So how does a person get from A to B? This is exactly why we have to normalize discussion around sexuality in this demographic. Because if we don't, then you're stuck. You're stuck with not having any... Um, kind of education about it, not having any preparation for it, not having anybody to talk to about it. And that's why we're doing this podcast, because you can talk about these things. And, you know, you are entitled to um, give consent uh, or, you know, not give consent. And not just because of halakha, you know, if you just say, well, I'm Shomer, that's not the, you know, you can also be entitled to not be Shomer and still say, no, this is not my team Lee. Like, I don't feel like doing this with you. I wanted to ask about when people, you know, discussing it out loud, I wonder if for some people, and I don't know if this is more prevalent in more right-wing communities, but maybe it's prevalent across the Orthodox spectrum. Maybe somebody is afraid that even discussing it will scare the other person away because let's say, for example, one person wants to talk about whether it's worth for them to be Shomer to in their own religious and physical life. And the other person might be, well, if that's even an issue for you, then I'm out of here because if I, I'm simply not in that place where I would ever even dream of going out with somebody who would think of touching outside the context of marriage. So it's one thing to say, Tali, that we have to normalize conversations, but conversations are also vulnerable and dangerous because you can kick somebody out effectively or that person could kick you up because it's not that you said, that I'm touching you, it's the fact that you're willing to even consider it might say, we are clearly in different worlds right now. How's right. that and, and you clearly are. I mean, if somebody's going to say, well, look, you know, I am so- Well, not necessarily. You could have somebody who perceives of himself or herself as Haredi, for example, and yet at the same time, like the letter writer who said her children go to Haredi schools, at the same time, just because you portray as Haredi and you see yourself as Haredi, that doesn't mean that every Haredi sees it as all on or all off. That person can also see things as a dimmer. So you might not be in different worlds, really. One person no, might but perceive you, it like but that. you're not in the, when I say you're, you're, you might not be compatible, it's not because you're not in different worlds, but because you have a different, you know, way of different values or different way of looking at it. I think what's more common and um, and I think that this is an unfortunate situation is that there is um, there is kind of like physical activity or sexual activity that takes place without any discussion about it as though it's kind of split into like we're not really doing this kind of thing. And I think we've talked about this before, by the way, and I would also remind 
listeners that we have an earlier episode from a couple seasons ago about late singles. We we're talking more then, I think, about people in their late 20s, 30s. Um, and that's was more, um, I think, that demographic. Today, we're really talking more about right. mamash midlife. Um, but even so, I think you'll have people, even at midlife, although it's less common, because I think at midlife, people are generally more integrated in terms of who they are, and they don't really suffer too much with split off parts because you're more mature and you're more developed. But for many people still, this idea that they're um, doing something that's not halachic, they can't really wrap their heads around that they're choosing it. And so they do it as this kind of thing that's happening to them. And there's no real discussion about it. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous because you're not exactly taking accountability for what you're doing. You're, you're doing it as this kind of like, you know, we talked about it before, um, you know, um, nafalnu, you know, we, 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 fell, failed. we failed, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, which is, which is, you know, which is, um, I would say a legitimate experience as well. There are people that will say, look, you know, it was too hard and we broke Shomer and, you know, let's try hard or not to. Okay. That's, again, I'm not judging any of these experiences, but the experience of that didn't really happen. We didn't really do that, or we're not really hooking up or we're not really, I mean, that's kind of dangerous because that's being done in a split off way from the rest of who you are. Can you explain why that's dangerous? I mean, why wouldn't it be, why it is it not a healthy way? Therefore I can still maintain my well, integrity. And you know, my it might identity. not be dangerous. It might not be dangerous in this age group that you might get pregnant because you're not using your frontal lobe enough to think about birth control, but it might be dangerous um, if you, uh, you know, aren't thinking about you know, things like STDs using a condom, mm -hmm. people in this age group need to think about things like that if they're going to be sexually active with more than one person. Um, you know, it's, it could be dangerous if that person that you're having sex with is married. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why kind of splitting into a behavior without taking along your um, judgment um, can be dangerous. I always say this, I think we're accountable. We're responsible. We choose our behaviors. Um, we have to be able to say, this is what I'm choosing to do, or okay. to be able to say, I'm choosing not to do it. Can you talk a little bit about how dating in later life, midlife or later, how it's fundamentally different to doing it earlier? In other words, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I mean, the fact that you're bringing your experiences with you, what problems does often arise, whether sexually or otherwise, in the dating process that come from being a, uh, a person, a later single or a divorcee or someone who's widowed? How does that affect? I the mean, dating? there's so much, and it's there, again, there's like no universal answer for this. It's so different for everybody, and the differences have to do with your own personality, your own skills at intimacy and attachment, your own past experiences. It's different if you're widowed or if you're divorced. A lot of people who are widowed almost say they, you know, first of all, not everybody who was widowed had a great marriage, but a lot of people did. And for those people, it's, um, you know, they, they, they really want to marry somebody very often who understands what they've been through, um, uh, who, who, you know, where they could talk about their partner freely and um, where that, they're totally fine with the other person because they're part of that relationship. Yes, that might be a situation of there being four people in the bed mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that that can that can happen. That person's always there with you. There's so many um, from from the point of view of um, so many issues around being vulnerable, being authentic. Was the relationship that you had for so many years of your life a safe one? Was it one that you had real um, connection and um, friendship and are you trying to um, reestablish that or can you wrap your head around the fact that it's not going to be the same it's going to be different the expectations might be different um, 
there's no idealization of what you had or what you, if you're single and never married, what you might've always wanted to have. Because a lot of times later in life, we marry for companionship. We don't wanna be alone, but it's not a perfect situation. Um, so that's one issue. Now, as far as sexual issues, I think that um, there's just too much fear about sexual functioning. People are afraid that they're you know, gonna get married and they're not gonna be able to have an erection or their erection's not gonna be sustainable or there's gonna be pain with intercourse. Um, this is especially common, I would say, um, amongst people who will come for sex therapy who are not sexually active because of their being very religious and not want, you know, definitely um, having sex before marriage would not be an option. And I do wanna shout out to that demographic because they are there. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to be able to provide, um, assistance, you know, certainly therapeutically for people who are not going to, um, check out their sexual compatibility before marriage. We even actually have, I, in this book, I am for my beloved that I wrote with, um, David Ribner. Um, we have a case study in here about a couple getting married, um, who did not have sex before marriage, um, in their sixties where I don't remember where it is, but like the guy has some erectile issues and she has some pain with intercourse issues. This is very common. This comes up. Hmm. Um, and just to kind of give the headline of that kind of um, counseling, um, what we usually want to tell people is just, you know, uh, to learn to really um, appreciate uh, pleasure, that sex should not be performative, um, that the relationship does not need to be based on whether or not, you know, the function works. Although I have to say for many people, especially people who have been in marriages um, where there was sexual dysfunction, they definitely, and, you know, completely legitimately would be very afraid to have that same thing happen again, mm -hmm. um, which is why communication about this is so important. But back to my point about, um, you know, valuing pleasure and not performance and not worrying about, um, you know, you, you would have to, and this is true, by the way, when we do our episode on married couples um, who get into their later years and there are some issues with functioning, there might be some vaginal dryness, there might be some erectile dysfunction, you know, there might not be that same kind of flow that was in the past. So we'll talk about that. But, you know, what I'm going to say is the same thing that I'm going to say in terms of, um, you know, it's not all about function. And uh, I look forward to that episode because I hope to also bring some data from studies about why older people um, continue to value sex past the reproductive years, why, why sex is so important, why it is such an important part of who we are. Um, and we often... And again, coming back to this demographic, because there's no legitimate way to talk about it, we often ignore the person who's the sexual human being, even though they haven't been in a married in a married um, relationship. Uh, they're still sexual human beings, and not being able to talk about it or saying, you know, what's there to talk about? Either you're, you know, um, either you're, you know, this like transgressive person that's transgressing halakha, or you're just like a misken who can't do anything for you, what's there to talk about? And, and I think that that's a very kind of um, reductionist and not to mention not particularly empathic approach. I want to ask you two questions now about older singles who do get married. When uh, my first question is this, is a lot of guilt involved, for example, when let's say someone who's been widowed marry somebody else. Is it a problem mm. often that the person feels that they're betraying their first partner? You know, often we can assume that for the sake of argument, it was a wonderful marriage and the person unfortunately passed away. Now that person sees companionship and do they feel that they are actually betraying their original partner by getting married again and sexually yes. or otherwise? Sometimes. And sometimes really the therapeutic work really is about, you know, being able to kind of heal that sense of guilt. I think that um, for many individuals who were married to partners who were sick and, you know, had a process, often that was discussed. Often the partner had an opportunity to say, look, I, I want you to continue to live. I want you to, to get married again. I want you to be able to. And I think that that's 
you know, oh, I'm getting emotional because um, <laughs> I, I just know people and, uh, you know, they it's a gift to give to your partner to give them that permission. Mm -hmm. What about a situation where someone who's been widowed is now together with someone who was divorced? Those are very, very different experiences. They both experienced loss, but one had what we can say was at least at the end of their marriage, a failed marriage. That's why they got divorced, presumably. And the other one, maybe it was a failed marriage also, but as far as we know, it was a loving marriage that ended tragically in a different kind mm -hmm. of way. Does that often yeah. cause a certain kind of tension because their memories of what they had are so vastly and importantly different? Well, I think whatever permutation you end up with, whether they're both divorced or one was divorced and one was widowed or one was single and one was, whatever permutation you come up with, you're going to have issues. And, you know, I don't think that you can say like, oh, this is a great match or this is going to have these issues or this is going to have, um, I know people who have really have wonderful second marriages, um, even though they were widowed and, um, and maybe one partner was divorced and it's different. I think the idea is that it's not, it's not the same marriage. It's a, it's a, it's a different marriage. And, um, you know, even like married people at midlife sometimes marry each other again, so to speak. Like they 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 have a different marriage because the first marriage was so problematic, but they didn't divorce. They went through couples therapy and they changed their marriage and it's a different marriage. And, you know, you sometimes have to kind of give up on those expectations and accept what your marriage is and make the best out of it. So it's not about better or worse but it's really about you know what this marriage is about how we are in this marriage what's our contract what's our levels of kind of doing things differently um my children you know we didn't even get into that whole thing which is so complicated about blended families and my children and your children and your children in their 20s and 30s accepting or not accepting or encouraging or not encouraging um having grandparents um having grandchildren together um weddings, uh, who walks down. I mean, we didn't, you know, we, we were focusing on intimacy and the sexuality, but we could do a whole other podcast who just pays? on uh, who pays. <laughs> yeah. Um, remembering all the, grand sometimes there's a lot of grandchildren between the two of you when you get to be two people in their fifties or sixties. Um, so there's, there's really so much to work out. Also, do you live together all the time or do you maybe, you know, keep separate homes? Sometimes there are couples who, who, who still very much value their privacy or their alone time. Um, there's really so much to talk about. I mean, to think that, you know, that there isn't because either you're doing something not allowed or I, I don't know, that doesn't seem to resonate with me. Okay. Um, are you, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to the topic before we uh, sign off, Tali? Um, I don't know. Do you? Do you think we've covered I think, a lot I think here? we covered a lot of the basic ideas. What we're doing here today is obviously not an extensive and comprehensive discussion. We're opening up a conversation. I'll just say one thing by my as my own conclusion, which is that yesterday I was interviewing for my other podcast, Orthodox Conundrum, Rabbi Yoni Rosenzweig. And it was not this was not our topic, but in that context, we were actually talking about LGBTQ issues. In the context mm. of that discussion, he actually cited a Rambam in the Moran of Uchim, the guy for the perplexed, in section three, chapter 34. And this gets back to what we mentioned at the beginning. I'd just like to mention, it's a very almost surprising Rambam. And this Rambam effectively says that sometimes the Torah will treat people not fairly meaning the Torah was described or designed, the Torah was designed for Klal Yisrael, it was designed for the people as a whole. And sometimes, unfortunately, individuals get left aside in ways which are not really fair to them. And I'll even just read it over here. It says, the, the law was not given with a view to things that are rare. For in everything that it wishes to bring about, be it an opinion or a moral habit or a useful work, it is directed only toward the things that occur in the majority of cases and pays no attention to what happens rarely or to the damage occurring to the unique human being because of this way of determination and because of the legal character of the governance. For the law is a divine thing, and it is your business to reflect on the natural things in which the general utility, which is included in them, nonetheless necessarily produces damages to individuals as is clear from our discourse and the discourse of others. 
one more line. In view of this consideration also, you will not wonder at the fact that the purpose of the law is not perfectly achieved in every individual, and that on the contrary, it necessarily follows that there should exist individuals whom this governance of the law does not make perfect. Hmm. The Rambam is saying, and we don't have to agree with the Rambam, this is not the only position, but he's saying that the Torah was given for a people, and the Torah was not given to individuals. And I compare it in some ways to, you know, you're driving down the street, let's say Road 38 near Ostali at night, and you get to a traffic light and it's four in the morning and there is no car coming from the other side. The only car there is a policeman, a police car looking out at you. The law is imperfect. There is no reason for you to stop at this red light and be late for whatever you're getting to at four in the morning. I don't know why you're late for something at four in the morning, but there's no reason to stop. But if you run that red light, the policeman will rightly give you a ticket because the law is not made for individuals. It's made for the group as a whole. And as a group, you can't run red lights, even if in this particular circumstance, it's really not relevant to you. It might even be bad for you. It might make you late for something. In a sort of the flip side of that is that we have to have empathy and say, just because someone sees halacha as hurtful, that doesn't mean the person is wrong. That person can truly be suffering under the halachic system. That's not an indictment of halacha. The Rambam would say that's a natural and automatic consequence of having halacha that's not made for every personalized individual. It's about having something that's made for people. And in order to develop and understand the empathy and to develop empathy and to include in our way of thinking, to have a little bit of, or to avoid that judgmentalism, to understand that how could you dare break halacha in this case? I'm not suggesting anyone do that. But understand what may work for you. The Rambam himself says it might not be working for that other person. He's not saying the person should break it, but at least have a little bit of sympathy and empathy when that person doesn't see this as enriching that person's life. It damages that person's life. And we have no one less than the Rambam himself, Maimonides, to say, yes, that happens. So a little bit of empathy is in order, I think. Yeah. I Did you have um, Ravioni as a, because of what Rav Herschel Schachter said? No, no, no. It was, it was, it was, no, it was actually from before that. It was from before. It, oh, it was okay. because of the Ben Shapiro article, which I had one article, I had ah, okay. one discussion. This was a follow-up discussion. The first one was saying why we thought that Ben Shapiro's article in which he castigated the modern Orthodox world for its uh, allowance of too much acceptance of LGBTQ. Oh, right, right, right. So one person, uh-huh. Rabbi Dr. Svisinensky said why he thought Ben Shapiro was wrong. This was Ravioni Rosenzweig. Yeah. This is Ravioni Rosenzweig saying why he um like what positive things we should be doing like how the orthodox community should should relate to members who are I'm not looking not forward straight. and i think that timing actually is great given uh that particular um occurrence and i really look forward to listening i think uh we can, all all rabbis can learn a lot from ravioni absolutely true okay mm-hmm. well tali thank you this is very interesting and i appreciate your insights. I hope our listeners appreciate it as well. Please remember to go to intimatejudaism.com, subscribe to our podcast, share the podcast, go to jewishcoffeehouse.com and talyrosenbaum.com and write to us at intimatejudaism at jewishcoffeehouse.com. Thanks for joining us. Bye.